Hello and welcome back to Retro Ranger. Today we're talking about the Sega Dreamcast and some of the interesting add-ons and accessories alongside the relevant games that were paired with Sega's last venture into the hardware market. These accessories range from cool and innovative to downright disappointing, but each has an interesting story for sure. Let's jump in. Okay, starting with the innovation side of the spectrum, here's Sega's answer to save file management on a disk-based console, the Visual Memory Unit, or VMU as it's often referred to as. This device served primarily as a removal storage device like most memory cards you'd already be familiar with, but beyond that had a few interesting capabilities. Notably, it has a 48 by 32 dot LCD screen that was used for a number of secondary purposes, including being able to manage the storage, display basic information like the time, and this was before cell phones were mass adopted, so this was an actual feature for what it's worth, and perhaps the most interesting, games. VMUs have an 8-bit CPU with 128 kilobytes of flash memory to run these features, but as you can see, features a directional pad and buttons to support basic games, which can be played independent of the Dreamcast itself. And while it did take two CR2032 batteries to allow it to do its function outside of the Dreamcast, it would typically blow through both of those in a matter of a week or two. While some games use the display cleverly as a supplementary game information while playing, like Resident Evil Code Veronica's health display seen here, oftentimes it just displayed the logo of the game you were playing, sadly. Most of the games available for the VMU were add-ons to the normal games that you'd buy, sometimes gated by in-game progress before it would let you install them. Many of these cashed in on the Tamagotchi craze, letting you grow some virtual pet, though there are some notable exceptions, and my favorite being Pinta's Quest for one of the best games on the system, Skies of Arcadia. It lets you explore as Pinta to complete random encounters to earn items or money. And as you do, you can bring these items back from the questing into the game as a reward. So it was useful in addition to just a nice little extra as well. While sometimes it's worth noting that the connectors on the top did more than just plugging into the controller, it would actually allow you to connect two VMUs together, or you could trade files between them, which is nice considering that they didn't have a ton of space, especially if you've downloaded a game to it. While they did make memory cards without displays, like this third-party one I have here, anecdotally they seem to be less used than the display-capable units. Let's move on to the next accessory on our list. Okay, here's the Dreamcast microphone accessory. This little interesting add-on was sold exclusively with two games supported in North America and never as a standalone accessory. To function, it actually slides into the second slot in the controller so that it would accommodate a VMU in slot one. While it was also bundled with Alien Front Online, it's mostly known for its necessity in the game Seaman. It's a pet simulator where you raise and care for the seaman through its life cycle stages by manipulating the environment settings and talking with the creature. There's not much action, if any, to be had here, and is more of a simulation base than anything else. Since the Dreamcast tracked the date and time as a console, most of the progression would happen in real time. If you happen to abandon the creature for real life days, it would actually die and force you to restart. 
The different stages of evolution are quite interesting, even if it's not action-packed. In some ways, it's almost like a puzzle to figure out what to do or how to progress to the next stage. Even from the beginning, getting your egg to split into spore-like creatures, getting them to be ingested and live as parasites in the squid that comes with your tank, all make for some really interesting gameplay. The microphone itself worked as you'd expect, but in reality, it's the game's job to decipher and interact with what was said. You're just not my type. Perhaps the most notable element of the communications is that the English version of the game is narrated by Leonard Nimoy, who, of course, played Spock in Star Trek. Welcome to the laboratory of Jean-Paul Gasset. You'll witness before you a phenomenon like no other, a man of the sea, Seaman. Eventually, you'll grow your own food source for Seaman in an insect cage which requires a bit of its own maintenance. Here you get another life cycle for the caterpillar and moth sack row, and even spiders make an appearance. Oh, yummy baity goodness. Overall, the game works well, and despite it being about as slow paced as you can get, there's still fun to be had with Seaman. Conversing with the creature is interesting to see the responses and what you actually get asked in return. Anyways, that's the microphone accessory. Let's move on to something a little bit more exciting. It's rather difficult making out what's on the other side of this glass, so let me inquire. Are you a male or a female? You're a male of this species, eh? Well, I was hoping to meet a lady, but I guess I'm not in the position to be too choosy, am I? All right, let's talk about light guns because the previous generation of the systems like the Saturn and the PlayStation were fantastic in this regard. The Dreamcast had a few options as well as an official gun simply called the Dreamcast gun, which never actually saw the light of day in North America. And this was largely a result of timing around the Columbine shooting that made Sega really second guess bringing any of these light gun accessories to the market. Instead, we got light guns from third parties, and two that I'll cover here today is the Dream Blaster from Mad Cats, which was actually later adopted as the official gun in North America, and Interact's Starfire Light Blaster. Sadly, there's only about five games compatible with the light guns, and that's a real shame, as the system would have been able to match arcade levels for the classics. My two favorites of the bunch are House of Dead 2 and Virtual Cop 2, so let's just jump into the gameplay. Chances are you've already seen and played a lot of House of the Dead 2, but by some chance you've missed out on this one. It's an on-rails arcade shooting game that takes you around various levels, each with branching paths, which you can actually trigger by either shooting keys or saving potential victims in time. The music and action are great arcade fun, and there is a reason it continues to see a lot of popularity. <laughs> It's also the perfect B-movie experience with some of the most hilariously so bad it's good kind of voice acting of all time. I don't want to die. My God. Both light guns work as you'd expect. They each have spots to add a VMU, which is helpful for saving, but I just like it since it adds some weight to the guns. House of the Dead 2 thankfully includes a gun calibration mode in the options, which I actually felt necessary as by default it seemed a bit off. After switching back and forth between the different guns, I have to say the Starfire Light Blaster is by far the better choice, despite not getting the official designation. The overall size and feel is great, but I prefer the button and d-pad layout much more in addition to this reverse trigger, which acted as a helpful reload without having to shoot off the screen. While they're an unfortunate step down from Namco's manufactured light guns of the previous generation, the Starfire will make do for the few games that support it. Let's move on though to our next accessory. Alright, 
Here's the Dream Wheel by Mad Cats. While Sega did officially release a racing controller, this third-party entry added pedals and a stick shifter. Strangely though, despite having that shifter, there's no clutch pedal, which seems like a massive oversight. Did they not understand how manual transmissions work? Either way, the feel of this is cheap and unsatisfying to hold. Today, of course, racing wheels are clad in nice leather and really go an extra mile for authenticity. This one is nowhere close. There's a good amount of compatible games for the wheel, but it gives me a great excuse to talk about one of my favorite arcade driving games, Crazy Taxi. You're a taxi driver picking up passengers and dropping them off at their destinations as fast as possible, throwing all caution to the wind. You'll get extra cash for near collisions with other vehicles and other things like performing tricks. While the concept is simple, the gameplay is fun and addicting. Stopping precisely within the pickup and drop off zones will continue to be a fun challenge as you barrel your way through the routes at top speed. Take me to the park. Okay, but don't freak out on me. <laughs> don't Just shut up and let's roll. <laughs> that concept will go on to spawn other games like the Simpsons Road Rage series, which is the same basic game with a Simpsons theme slapped on top. It's also worth noting that the soundtrack was often praised, as you'd hear bands like Offspring comprise most of the track list. Make a run! All right, all right. Hey, you're going the wrong way. Follow the arrow. Yeah. You're gonna have all this. All right, all right. Yeah. Another game to check out is Looney Tunes Space Race, which saw a release on the PlayStation 2 and was in development for the Nintendo 64, but the Dreamcast version is great. Here you control one of the Looney Tunes characters through various futuristic environments that really shine in retrospect. The graphics, the environments, and the music all make for a solid kart racing game. You can collect weapons, of course, and while the attacks are expectedly plentiful, they're fitting with the theme of the show. What's that all about? Say what's going on? There's something great about seeing a piano or a safe fall on another racer. Well, until it happens to you, of course. The steering wheel works fine, but if I'm honest, I think I'd just prefer to use the standard controller instead. Accuracy with the analog is much easier to achieve than with this wheel, and since the racing games that I tend to play are less simulation-based, they typically require more snap movements than soft corrections. For Looney Tunes Space Race, for example, turning requires a lot of steerage on the wheel, so again, the analog stick is an advantage. If you really enjoy the experience of a wheel though, between this and the official one, I would surprisingly give it to this third party all said and done. Let's move on though to our next accessory. Okay, next up to review we have a few fishing controllers. Sega manufactured and released an official fishing controller that coincided with the release of their Sega Bass Fishing. Interact also came out with their controller called Fission Fishing Controller, both of which are largely identical, only Interact's reel makes a clicking reel sound, whereas Sega's does not. Shaped as the end of a fishing rod, these controllers would still feature typical buttons and directional inputs to help navigate the game menus to avoid having to plug in a normal controller in the second slot. However, there's no VMU slot on the rods, so saving still requires another controller either way. As you'd expect, most compatible games are fishing games, but what's more interesting is that you can actually use this controller to play Virtua Tennis, which I guess kind of makes sense, but what's even stranger is that you can actually also use it to play Soul Calibur. Checking out Sega Bass Fishing, there's not much to report in terms of gameplay, as it's just fishing, and really only fun if you're the one playing, but as far as the genre goes, it's probably my favorite, as it attempts to keep it a little bit more arcade-like, instead of just endlessly reeling in my line with nothing actually happening. When you do hook a fish, the whole controller will shake and rumble, which is a nice touch to the experience. Bite fish! Hit bonus! Turn the rod right! Be careful with the tension! Turn the rod right! 
And you're almost there. Be careful. Oh, a big one! What's always made me wonder with Sega Bass Fishing is when you continue your game, the announcer tells you to fight. Ready? Fight! Guessing this isn't the catch and release kind of fishing. Between the two controllers, I prefer the Sega official controller best, since it seemed to track better than the Interact one does, though that could be just the specific ones I have available. The real clicking was nice, but not enough to put that controller over the top, especially considering they both still have that plastic on plastic squeaking noise either way. Overall, while the accessory wasn't required to have fun with any of these games, and beyond the interesting factor of Soul Calibur and Virtua Tennis compatibility, it was a nice add-on and they're relatively cheap to add to your collection, hovering around 20 or so dollars. Let's check out the next accessory. And you're almost dead. Turn the rod left. Be careful. Okay, an average size. Good job. I'm bonus. Okay, perhaps my most favorite accessory though is the keyboard, and that's generally to do with one of the most interesting compatible games for it. Of course, in the heyday of the Dreamcast, the mouse and the keyboard would be most popular with Fantasy Star Online, which was a juggernaut for the system, but with the last official servers offline since 2010, the game that's gotten all the attention is Typing of the Dead. This is what an educational game should be, as it's incredibly fun and hilarious to play while learning to type, if that was your goal. It's a re-released modification of House of the Dead 2 that has in-game characters strapped with Dreamcasts on their backs and keyboards mounted to their chests to take on zombies by showing them how good you type. Don't know, but it's very similar to the 1998 Curian case. That case? Gary, going for film confusion in the city. Okay, let's meet at Sunset Bridge. As enemies and other dangers appear, so do word and sentence bubbles that must be typed in completion to kill or deflect said enemy or danger. And while this sounds like a silly twist on an already laughable title, it works so well. It's legitimately a good time, and honestly one that I enjoy bringing out every so often. In fact, I'd go as far as to say I end up playing this one more than the light gun original. How could anyone do this? These word bubbles though, boy, can these get strange or just downright hilarious. Normally I'm a solid typer, as a programmer I'm constantly clicking throughout the day, but it really doesn't matter because the words and stuff that you'll be typing is likely things that you've never typed before, at least not together. Adding some of the challenge, as most of your brain makes you just confirm, is that really what I read? Bosses all are here, of course, and they feature their own typing mechanic that's usually in theme with their original fight. Overall, this is a great game, and I'm disappointed that the few sequels released after this were exclusive to Japan. That said, this was a really interesting take to reuse an existing accessory, and one I'm glad landed here in North America. <laughs>
And there you have it, some of the more interesting accessories for the Sega Dreamcast. One peripheral we didn't get a chance to talk about was the broadband adapter, which unsurprisingly was used with popular games like Fantasy Star Online. Still, there's plenty of interesting ways to dive into the Dreamcast, and they really make for some engaging time. Let me know which accessories that you gamed with the most in the Dreamcast in the comments down below. And until next time, of course, thank you for watching Retro Ranger.